Hey, this is Passy from Passy's World of ICT, the guy with the white hat. And today we're uh, not actually going to be doing any programming. We're going to be looking at some um, sort of design principles, some guidelines for how to make really nice screens and to make your apps um, well designed and functional in Visual Basic. Uh, but not just Visual Basic specific, this could really apply to designing um, any app or even uh, websites and things like that. But anyway, what is good design? You know, often you can just tell something's a good design, like you look at that and you go, oh yeah, that's good. Uh, whereas you look at that and you don't have those same sort of feelings about a good design. Uh, so, you know, there are things we've learned from seeing a lot of cars and hearing people talk about them. You know, we know what's kind of a well-designed good one and what necessarily may not be. And how could we make a checklist of things or some principles or guidelines or a set of rules so that we could figure out, you know, what is a good car and what's a not so good car? Well, one of my first criteria would be, you know, anything with just three wheels, not good. Uh, we want at least four wheels on the car. OK, so that could be one of the um, design rules uh, that we set up. So, you know, we've all used a lot of websites as well, and we know kind of the difference between a good one and a bad one, like, whoa, that one looks way too busy and cluttered. Although the pictures on it are kind of interesting, but look, that's a definite no-no. That is not a good design, and most people you talk to would say that. It's frustrating for the user to try and figure out, you know, what are all these links? Which one do I click on? Uh, what's going on here? Um, you know, that'd be a disaster all crammed up on a small mobile phone screen or even a tablet, perhaps. And here's one that was a classic example that's been around a while. The world's worst website with the world's worst color scheme. Uh, no pictures or graphics, no buttons anywhere to navigate to different pages. Um, so yeah, straight away, we just know these two are bad designs. People would know that if you surveyed them or asked them. Um, so let's look at some good website designs. So this one's a really nice one. Um, this one's some design awards, actually. You know, there's the simple standard navigation buttons across the top. And we've really only got three main sections, kind of the introductory video, which doesn't start up straight away and interrupt you. You can click to watch it. And these other two areas which have um, links you can click on. Okay, and uh, yes, actually seeing this uh, the lady in that picture is going to make me a bit homesick for CF Africa uh, from... Uh, but anyway, let's get on with it. Now, this one here is um, like a really nice color scheme. You know, beers come in um, brown bottles and green bottles. So the whole thing's in brown and green. Simple to click icons, sort of pictures with writing there to tell you where to go. That would work great too on a mobile phone screen or something smaller. So yeah, that one is awesome. So we all kind of know what good design is. Now, in terms of products, you know, it doesn't have to be a software product like a website, but people talk about this thing called form and function. So the product has to look good. You know, it has to be easy and familiar to use and quickly get the required results. So like this is one of my A1 tick pluses for uh, design, for form and function, the Nutribullet. Um, such a great idea with this uh, cup on top that you can just sort of turn it upside down, get your cup off, and you've already got kind of that drinking cup you can take away with you with your smoothie, or you can pour it out into a decanter. Uh, really straightforward and simple to use. Um, fantastic product. That is good design. That has form and function on it. Now, this one here, a friend of mine had one of these, and look, it did pulp up... Um, any kind of vegetable or like sweet potato, anything you put in there. And it kind of had these two containers to put the pulp in one and the juice in the other. But then you had to pull all this stuff apart into a million pieces to kind of clean it. Um, you know, that doesn't really sort of tick the boxes on form and function like the Nutribullet it does. So when we're developing application software, there are a number of specific ways um, and there's technical terms for them, which we're going to have to learn uh, during this lesson. And we want that end goal that the thing has form and it has function. So think of these things we're going to go through now as being like the design rules or the principles of good design for when you're making any kind of software product, especially we're going to focus here on Visual Basic um, Windows form applications. So 
even though people haven't seen a lot of you know visual basic screen forms especially if they're programming in some on some other language or they're not even programmers at all you can probably tell a bad one um pretty much straight away and this was one of the reasons why we thought we really need to make this video because believe it or not, we had an assessment task for our students that are learning programming. And this was, they had to make this form for a simple string processing program. But look, some of them wrote in old English writing that was really hard to understand or some really unusual font. Uh, this, these are buttons which were actually on someone's project. Um, you know, purple, which is a nice color because that's a color of Visual Studio and of my shirt. But look, they've got this aqua writing that's microscopic that you can hardly see um, against that background. Everything's kind of placed randomly all over the form. And up in here, like where they type their name in, it's in microscopic kind of size text. And for some reason, it's kind of caught right up in the top hat, left hand corner of the text box. So like someone didn't make this whole form. This is kind of just uh, grouping together all of the um, things which people did on their assessment project. And I would have thought that, you know, from the forms we've been making on the other projects, you know, during this um, programming course, they would have kind of got the idea of, you know, what are good colors, what's good contrast, how we use plain, simple fonts, how we line things up. But obviously a lot of people hadn't caught onto those concepts. So that's something we really uh, need to get onto. So, like we said, you know, all of those things there on that list are kind of wrong with that form and it's hard to figure out how to use it as well. So it's not attractive and it's not easy to use. So that is not good design. So the whole purpose of this lesson is to give you a checklist of like principles, things to look out for so that you can spot when you've got a well-designed screen form and a well-designed application. All right, there will be some special vocabulary words you have to use uh, about designs, but We'll give you lots of examples and things in here. So just like any other product like the fabulous Nutribullet, who are not sponsoring uh, this lesson, by the way, but I just think they're fantastic. Um, the VB software, the main thing is attractive and very usable. So, you know, we're gonna go through a lot of terms here, but just keep in mind the big overall picture, the big picture is that you want your screen form to be attractive and the actual kind of using of it, the clicking and whatever people have to type in that they do is very friendly and usable. So it has a good user experience. So look, let's start going through the first category, attractiveness. So we're talking about visibility and color schemes mainly. So we're gonna go into these different things listed there, color psychology, your contrast, um, what colors are best to pick for what sort of application. Uh, we'll go through that in detail. Then there's legibility, which is kind of a big Big word you have to learn. That just means that um, it's clear, you know, like if someone has really messy handwriting uh, and you can hardly read what they've written with a pen. Well, that's not good legibility. In fact, if you can't read it, it's called illegible. So legibility is just a word that it's nice and easy to read and see and it's clarity, you know, it's nice and clear and things. Um, structure is how you set up the form. So we saw in that really bad one, everything was just randomly like all over the place on the form. You want them lined up with like rows and columns, plenty of white space gap around things and the left balancing the right and the top balancing the bottom. So we call all of that structure. Um, familiar for our VB applications, uh, when the thing runs, it should look very Windows 10-ish. You know, there should be error messages, boxes, buttons, all those sort of things which you'd see in Windows, drop down lists with a little arrow in the corner and all that sort of stuff. So those aspects there, we'll be going through those in detail and giving you examples of them. We're just gonna hit you up with the full list first and then we'll have slides where we go through each one of these items so you can understand what they are. All right, now on the usability part of it, there's uh, a lot more criteria. So just as we said, familiar also sort of comes into usability. You know, if it looks like a Windows, um, 10 screen. Well, then people are going to recognize those design elements like drop down lists where they have to click an arrow in the a down arrow in the corner to get the list and they'll immediately know how to use it. So it's going to be very familiar, okay? Uh, because we make our VB applications just look like normal stuff in Windows that if people have used Windows, they'll know how to do. Now, affordance, everyone thinks straight away, oh, it's how much money it costs, you know? Was it a really expensive 
app to download and buy. Now, affordance doesn't mean that. The word for that is affordability. What this affordance is, is just think of it as features you cannot afford not to have, all right? So when we've got input on our form, you know, if we want people to type stuff in, we should really have just a text box there on the form that stays on the form so they can look back and see what they typed in. When we did some prototyping, like in the blood alcohol calculator project, we did just have pop-up message boxes to get the input quickly and check the algorithm, but that would not be the way to go. That is not good affordance for a finished application. Now, consistency, if you've got multiple screens, they need to be the same color scheme, like you wouldn't kind of have a blue and yellow color scheme and then they click a button to go to the other form another part of the application you know and that one's kind of in bright red and uh, black color or something right you need to keep a color consistency theme so it all looks like a matching set and with the buttons too um, if you're going to have like exit buttons and call them exit make sure on every screen it's called exit don't have like one screen where it's called exit another one where you've got the button and that does the same thing but you've called it quit and on a third screen, you've called it end. That's just gonna be confusing to the user. So we need consistency. Now, tolerance. Tolerance is um, catering for errors and problems, all right? So it's kind of like understanding things, being nice to people, being tolerant. So this is really validation. This is where all that validation learning we've been doing comes in. So the app is forgiving and will give them validation messages, nice messages that tell them how to fix it and they'll be simple and clear messages. Um, scalable, you want a screen design that's not all kind of crammed up in small writing that might be okay on a laptop computer, but won't look good kind of on a tablet or a phone. So you wanna keep things simple, uncluttered with big size fonts, so it's scalable. It could be used on different screen sizes and different devices. Although you won't be doing that so much with the Visual Basic software, but with other software you are writing. All right, now there's timeliness and accuracy, like uh, in the calculators project, we we're talking about things like the blood alcohol content calculator, the BMI, calculator they just need to be tested and checked against manual calculations to make sure they're giving accurate answers because people are using the app and they're relying on that answer to tell them something really important uh, there's another big word we have to learn accessibility nothing to do with microsoft access the fabulous database product but um it needs to be easy to use for all kinds of users so people like me that wear glasses and can't see anything written very well without them um, you know, don't use microscopic fonts. It's going to make it hard for guys like me. Um, and also a few other things which we'll talk about in detail later. Uh, interoperability. Okay, that's a really big word. Interoperability. All right, it's not about a surgeon operating on people, but it needs to um, kind of interface and join up with other applications and data uh, without you even noticing it. So a Visual Basic program app that you've got it could read some data out of an excel spreadsheet that you've also got and you won't even kind of notice that it's happened it just all happens seamlessly so the interface is really smooth so that's interoperability we'll talk about that later um, so a similar thing is completeness so they shouldn't have to go outside the vb app to perform tasks so if you're reading in a text file they shouldn't have to open up Notepad++ or Notepad um, and make changes to that text file. They should be able to do all their processing of the text file actually from within the Visual Basic application and not have to use other apps like Notepad um, on that file. Relevance, anything you put on the form should just be something that's needed and something that makes sense. Like, you know, if someone was going to be clicking to get a digital download, you wouldn't be asking them to put their kind of postal address um, onto the form, all right? Because they're just going to get it digitally. It's not like a FedEx guy is going to go and deliver it to their house or anything like that. Responsiveness, you need to uh, let the user know what's going on all the time. Just be responsive and talk to them. So uh, if they do change something on a screen and they click this update button or a save button, you need to just give them a little message that, yeah, hey, the thing saved okay, all right? In your program where it was doing that saving, if there's no error, exception errors, um, have a little message box pop up telling them it's all okay. Otherwise, they might just keep clicking that update or save button wondering, hey, is this thing really working? Because there's no response 
uh, from the app to tell me that anything's happened all right and last of all efficiency so we want people to be able to do things quickly and easily for the best user experience you know if they can just click a drop down list and pick something that's a lot better and a lot more efficient than if they have to like type stuff into a text box manually and then click some button on the form to get things to happen and we'll show you all about that Okay, so that was the grand list. So we'll go back right to the start at attractiveness and talk about colors. Now, an interesting thing is there's a psychology of colors and it's not just kind of random that some companies pick blue for their uh, logo and other ones pick red and some people pick orange, right? There's a real kind of um, psychological reason for that and emotions people feel with colors. So orange colors for companies you know that's clarity and warmth uh orange is no sorry yeah an orangey gold yellow is kind of clarity and warmth a kind of yellow color orange is cheerful confident you know red is excitement and bold like you know we're going to drink coca-cola and have a really great time you know just like in the coca-cola ad and all this sort of stuff um blue is for kind of reliable trustworthy companies like intel and you know um Dell and Oral B and Lowe's and all those ones listed there. All right, so there is a definite color guide. So we'll just go through the colors quickly. Psychology of blue. Blue is very com popular for companies, right? It means, you know, um, trust and reliability. So these are well known products, and you'd trust uh, that Samsung, <clears throat> if you buy one of their mobile phones or TVs, and that's what I've got, and they're really good, but uh, when they're not sponsoring this, you know, it's going to be reliable and you can trust them. Green is for all this environment stuff. Very clever how the petrol company BP um, changed their kind of whole logo to look like the sun and flowers and, you know, happy environmentally friendly sort of stuff. That was done deliberately, of course. Psychology of yellow, we've all seen kind of black and yellow warning signs and road signs, so it's a caution color, but it's, you know, also sunshine, warmth, and happy um bright times that's yellow as well red is for action so you've got your sort of high speed energy red bull you know red 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 honda motorcycles uh things like that and also for food things like kfc and you notice mcdonald's uses red and yellow so often they combine colors to get two psychological things going like mastercard here they've kind of got red for excitement Ooh, i'm excited to buy that item and the orange color means you know and it's going to happen really quickly and be a complete success because i'm doing it all with my mastercard all right so quick success um and excitement sort of joining two colors together there uh, now purple is a really interesting color that's kind of the color of royalty but you'll also notice magicians are uh, capes are always purple colored as well for kind of mystery and things like that and wealth and prestige it's all kind of about purple colors so because purple so awesome uh, we've actually got two slides here for purple and yeah the old visual studio is like a purple kind of logo which is interesting for the um, psychology of color and emotion uh, combined with that and Cadbury chocolate oh, you guys in America forget Hershey's you know the Dutch bitter stuff get onto this Cadbury stuff like we have here in Australia oh awesome chocolate anyway but they're not sponsoring um, this video so there's also the color wheel if you want to get into this this is good for form design and web design and uh, certain colors work really well together like yellow and blue work well because you'll get a really nice high contrast if you do yellow writing on a blue background uh, when colors are close together though like orange and kind of red uh, it's not going to look so good with orange letters on red although yellow is a little bit further away from red so you can see over here we've got um sort of yellow and red like shell use the petrol company on their logo and we've got red and yellow and you know they work quite well together um kind of maroon and gold is the washington redskins my old uh, football team in america uh yeah so they're good colors oh, i love those colors love my redskins all right so um yeah so colors and contrast you know this form here thinking about the psychology of color and the contrast this is the one we did for the um new member for the dog owners club and we sort of did it all green and gold and you know green is kind of the color of environment outdoors on the green grass in the fresh air and then we kind of got the gold and yellow for you know being warmth and happiness being out in the sunshine having a really good time running around with your um pet dog and stuff so that's kind of 
the theme here. It wouldn't have made sense to like make this some sort of purple or pink color um, for, for what we're talking about here, the Dog Owners Club. And also by using that green, white works really well. It gives you nice high contrast on that form. So you've got to think about your color combinations to get maximum contrast and clarity. Don't use red and green together. They're great for Christmas colors with a bit of white mixed in, but not good for colorblind people and not at all good for forms. And you can see with this writing, this font here, just like color of that against white, if you use bright vivid colors, like if that was yellow, we probably couldn't even read it. But yeah, these bright vivid colors um, don't work so well on a white background either, so avoid using them. So yeah, these should be things you could kind of pick up and know about, but we're talking all about color contrast there and about the psychology of color. Often it's relevant to make a certain app, certain colors, because it fits in with the right psychology um, for that particular application. All right, now another thing we had under attractiveness, I think legibility, readability, and clarity is one of the items. So we're talking about using these plain sans serif fonts, so not the curly old English history writing, but just like we've got on this PowerPoint slide, just really simple plain fonts that don't have any serif curly parts on them. So sans serif is uh, French, that's French for not having curly bits. Sans means without and serif means the curly bits on the letters. So sans serif means without all the curly bits. So look, this is a good one. And also the font size, having it in a hierarchy comes into effect too, that you should have large fonts for headings and smaller fonts for details and very small fonts for the fine print. So yeah, look, if we look at this form, which is a really nice one for a body mass index calculator, uh, notice that the headings in a nice large font and it's kind of got a background here to be like a label almost stuck on the top. So that looks really good. So that's telling us the goal of this thing is to calculate body mass index. The instructions here for entering the height and the weight, notice there's been a mixture of bold and normal text used, but they're in really small font, okay? They're just little fine details that people need to look at um, if they're not sure what's going on. And then we've got our height and our weight entered in nice kind of um, medium sized fonts there. The button is this nice blue color and we use capital letters, uppercase. So uppercase is like a call to action. When you see calculate, it's kind of like in big letters. So, oh, that's important. We need to do something here. And using that little um, kind of greater than sign there, the math sign at the end looks good. So let's click this and go and get our answer. And when we do get the answer, that's like in really big font and it's bolded. So that really draws attention to, hey, this is what this is all about. Um, that is your BMI value. And down the bottom, we've got a nice user-friendly kind of reference graph and grid there. And then the fine print of the explanatory notes down here is in super small writing, okay? So if people can't understand the sort of color scheme and scale, they can read that fine print and get some additional information. So like that is a really well designed form. And you'd say it's because, you know, it's got legibility, readability, and clarity. It's used a hierarchy of um, font size, which means, you know, hierarchy means, you know, like royalty, you've sort of got the queen or the king, who's a big person right up the top, just like your big heading on the form. And sort of down the bottom, you've got all the little people like us guys, you know, in the fine print at the bottom. All right, so that would be the technical terms if you had to explain that. Um, structure is all about alignment, you know, your rows and columns, leaving plenty of white space and not cramming it all up. So like that form that we looked at was horrible. What would be a good looking form? Something like this one here, which is kind of a bit copied off the BMI calculator if you uh, have a good look at it. But look, that screen is a much better structure. The reason is we've got white space around the object. So we've sort of got these gaps sort of um, here, just empty space, which is called white space. Even though it's yellow, it came from the old idea of a web page on a white background. So it is called white space. Uh, so that's really good. And notice we've got balance, like this gap on the left hand, right hand side over here is the same kind of size gap as on the left hand side. And the little gap of white space at the top here is the same kind of size as the white space at the bottom. So it's all kind of symmetrical and balanced. And that's another part of structure. And the objects are aligned in rows and columns. So we sort of go row, 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 row your boat going across here. And then we've got vertical alignment here. So when we go down the page here, these are all kind of in a line, like in a column. So yeah, you have your rows and your columns and everything's lined up, not kind of all over the place, random, uh, like in that other one up the top. 
And the font sizes are good to vary things. So the result is in big letters. Hey, it's yelling at you. That's the answer. And up the top, the original goal. Hey, this is what we're doing with this application. So that is kind of like really well designed. That's an example of great design right there. So things should be familiar. We should have this Microsoft Windows look and feel. So you can see here we've got drop down list um, boxes here with the arrows you'd click to pick centimeters, millimeters. Uh, if you're in America, you'd be picking inches and yards and your units. Uh, we've got radio buttons here where you can choose one or the other. We've got our buttons to um, activate things and do things here. The results come out in their own special little box down the bottom there. So they're kind of um, boxed up as a sort of little area of where everything happens down the bottom, your answers. And if they do an error, you've got the familiar Windows pop-up um, kind of box there that's got the OK button on it, all right? And this one here, you know, it's all laid out and this looks very Windows-ish. We've got drop-down lists, we've got kind of text all neatly formatted in a box here. We've got a picture box for the picture. We've got our buttons down the bottom. So that all looks very familiar, very Windows looking. And that's what people like because as soon as they see it, they go, oh yeah, this is cool. I know how to use this um, and it's all good. So familiarity is important. Now affordance, remember, is not how much it costs. It's stuff you can't afford not to have. So this is the um, prototype. If you remember back to the uh, doing calculators lesson that is in our programming course, when you do a prototype, sometimes it's really quick to just have people put in the values using message boxes, really quick to code. You can get their values in because you just want to test that your maths formula or math formula or uh, algebra equation or algorithm using in the program works. And that's a quick way of prototyping. But look, you would not release that to people to use for the final application because once they type something in the text box disappears, the pop-up box, they don't know what they typed in. So, you know, when we made the kind of like production or finished version of this, notice we had everything then input in text boxes. We had radio buttons here. It's all laid out with our rows and columns and, um, a lot better to use. So that's kind of affordance. We really can't afford to do it like without doing it like this. All right. This is the El Cheapo version. Okay. Uh, yeah, this one, you can't afford to have all these pop-up message boxes and stuff for entering data. Much cleaner to just have these three text boxes where they type it in and they can pick and click um, male or female. But legally, I think we should have an other on there as well in Australia. But we've got a disclaimer about that because you can't actually get a blood alcohol content for a person who's an other. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. Consistency. If your app has multiple screens, they all need to look the same. So this is kind of like this tennis dream team app we've been working on little bit by bit in the um, programming learning lessons. So in arrays, we kind of got that set up with uh, reading an array of player names, how you could search, uh, do a linear search here with this kind of area. And notice you can get a lot on a form if you divide it up into sections. So we were just using these group boxes in Visual Basic here to get each sort of set of items in its own little group box. And you can label the group boxes up the top if you want as well. So you can see we could fit it a lot of stuff on there. If you didn't have it kind of sectioned off in these group boxes, the form might look really crowded and complicated for the person to use. Um, so yeah, that's another good uh, design tip as well. And notice we've done them in rows and kind of columns just for the big boxes uh, that group things up. And then this other screen that you go to to get detailed information about each player, like their kind of biography. Yeah, see that's in the same color scheme, the same font, same kind of font sizes. It just looks like they're matching and they go together. So you need to have that different form screens from the same little app you're building. Uh, need to have consistent look and feel and not change the names of the buttons or the functions or the colors or layouts and all of that sort of stuff there. So that's like consistency and you've got to make sure you've got that. Now tolerance is catering for errors and problems. So poor old Barry Brainless here because Barry's not too smart. Um, he's having a lot of troubles like he's messed up the phone number there. It's not long enough in Australia. That should be 10 characters long. And the way we were telling him to do it on the form, which you can't see because the error box is on top of it, was to, you know, put the 04, then have dash four numbers, dash the other four. So Barry's messed that up. Um, Baza at Dodo.com. He just got a computer, Barry, and he's not sure about how they work. He's a bit of an old bloke, Barry. 
didn't grow up with computers and he hasn't done the at sign. He's just, someone told him his address was bazza at dodo.com. So he's just kind of put it in as best he can. Uh, when he was trying to set up his password and his confirmed password, obviously this other one here is a lot longer and different to um, the one he was trying to make here. So, and the one he was trying to make here isn't eight characters long. So it's all a mess. Now we don't want to, um, bombard Barry with four error messages straight away. So we could have had like four pop-up boxes here saying, hey Barry, you've really messed the whole thing up. This is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong, that's wrong. You know, it's like yelling at some kid going crazy at them because they've just made a few little mistakes. So we just do one thing at a time. The first thing that's wrong is the phone number. So we just put up an error box for the phone number. And this is being tolerant. This is how you do good tolerance uh, for handling a whole bunch of errors on an input form. So yeah, we'll just get Barry to kind of fix up that phone number. Then once he's got that fixed up, we'll sort of say, yeah, hey Basil, there's a thing with the email you got to fix up as well. So let's work on that next. That's being very tolerant, very understanding, very nice to the user. So tolerance is catering for errors and problems. Now in this one here, uh, the person's messed up the date, just a little typo. Instead of doing APR for April, they've done app, APP. Now look at this error message here. This is kind of a system generated type error message uh, from Microsoft that came automatically. For example, you may have entered text in a numerical field or a number that's larger than the field size. Yeah, well, that's nothing to do with kind of dates and telling us it's a date field or anything like that. So that's really unfriendly. So you should have in your programming to catch the exception and intercept that and give your own meaningful message. Don't let the um, computer system just put up these super generic uh, random messages that no one's going to understand. So that is not good tolerance, giving them just an auto-generated complicated system message. You're the programmer. You should be able to get in there and catch the exception and give them a nice clear message um, specific to this application, specific to what they've got wrong so that they, they can easily fix it. And that's all good tolerance. Um, scalable. So we think we talked about that. The screens need to be kind of kept simple and uncluttered. So this form here, you know, that could go onto a tablet or onto a mobile phone. But yeah, I know everyone's saying, but you can't put VBNet applications onto an iPad or a phone. Well, that's true. But like if you were building this as a prototype, just as a little app and you wanted to put it together, you did it in Visual Basic because Visual Basic is such a fabulous, easy programming language where you can get nice results like this. You can then send that right through Airtasker or something to someone in the Philippines and for really cheap money or whatever, they'll build you a little um, Android or iOS app that looks the same and can go on a phone, all right? So that's kind of the idea here. You wouldn't be putting your Visual Basic one on there, but you might be air tasking it out and someone else could build something that looks the same in Android or iOS for you. Uh, timeliness and accuracy. So stuff needs to be accurate and up to date. So in our individual team member, information for the tennis dream team and you might be making for your project a soccer players dream team english premier league or something else or maybe an nba basketball dream team or an nfl uh, american kind of football dream team we're going to have these little biographies highlighting highlights in the player's career. Now, we've got here that uh, John Patrick Smith, awesome Aussie tennis player, actually. Um, his highest rating uh, so far in like when he was playing doubles was 52. If this changes, if he plays some really good doubles matches in a tournament and that goes up, uh, we need to change that all right to the highest one he gets maybe he goes up to 45 or something so that needs to be up to date and kept accurate so that's a really important thing timeliness means there's um it's correct it's on time it's up to date and accuracy so if you're doing a bmi calculator you've got to make sure that that's giving accurate correct answers and not misleading the user who might go on some you know epic dieting scheme when it turns out they're actually at the correct weight um, accessibility, so vision impaired people. Uh, let's have a look at this form here. So the color scheme and size of those fonts would be okay for people that wear glasses. Like if I take my glasses off right now, I can even still see that and read the numbers fine. So that's good for vision impaired people. Um, the language is simple. So people that don't have English as their first language uh, could possibly, you know, work out those words and figure out what it's doing pretty easily. Uh, the actual 
example numbers we've used here hopefully people know ten dollars plus another two dollars fifty would be twelve dollars fifty uh, that kind of makes sense with the numbers and doesn't look too complicated for them and some users they might have had an accident with their hands like I had a bike crash and mangled um, this hand which has had a lot of surgery on it uh, but it, and it's good now pretty good um, yeah they might have trouble because of that like moving the mouse and if things are really close together and really small it might be hard for them to actually get on something and click it easily so yeah you need to think about that controls like buttons have spaces between them and they're a nice big size that's easy to click um, without clicking something else accidentally as well so that's all about accessibility now it's always going to be an accessibility it's kind of called accessibility people have super long names this dog club forms okay like you could type in an epic long name there but this has got lots of real estate and space on it um, other forms may not have as much room in the text box for the name maybe they've only got a short little text box just make sure the max length property in vb you set it up really high like maybe a hundred um, characters that way that someone even if the box is small they can keep typing into it and the kind of writing will scroll along um, inside the box so they can put in their really long name so you've made it accessible even to people that have super long names interoperability is when we connect up with other systems so for access to be reading in stuff from a text file maybe an xml format data file excel data from a microsoft act Microsoft Excel spreadsheet or maybe a Microsoft Access database table and in our programming course we're planning to do lessons on all of this so far I've only done text files but there will be other lessons coming later on on the other ones um, so most real world apps do share their data with websites or even printers to print things out and if you connect to another system and you share the data and things work it's called interoperability so it's talking about the interface between the systems so for example when we put a photo onto Instagram um, there's interoperability between like Instagram and Facebook and email and messenger and all these other apps so you can easily just um, get that picture that post onto Facebook and you can easily email it to someone all right so Instagram is what we call it has great interoperability it's seamlessly with no fuss you don't have to do anything really much special at all it can connect and share data with the other systems all right so in visual basic just one example if we've got an excel spreadsheet there's actually this object you can drag out onto your vb form which is called a data grid view object and if you um, put that out on your form you can take what was in your spreadsheet here your excel spreadsheet with its rows and columns and you can get it onto your vb form with rows and columns and the titles of the columns up the top so this is really nice this is great interoperability because people looking at that it looks just like it did in excel and they can do um, read across look down columns just like they could in excel so fantastic interoperability on there a big green happy tick completeness the user shouldn't have to go outside the application so in our um, player information the information actually comes out of a text file uh, if you've done this exercise and we copy the text file into our bin debug folder of our app so it's sitting there but people shouldn't have to open notepad or notepad plus plus and go into this text file and do anything other than perhaps the initial setup of it the very first time um, but after that the program should handle it all so what we've got in the program here is we've got that if say Alden here changes coaches and he's no longer coached by Daniel Myers but someone else <coughs> we can easily change that on this form which is read in the information from the text box text file brought it into the program we can just edit it and change it here to the name of his new coach we can click that update button and visual basic behind the scenes will just take this new version of the text and put it into this text file here and store it permanently so everything is done within the app the reading in the update the actual editing of the data and the saving updating of it back to the original file store all of that's done within the application so that's called completeness uh, when you have all of that functionality within your VB app and that's the way you're supposed to do it because that is good design of software Software. Um, relevant. So, this, uh, what do we got here? This was our prototype version of the blood alcohol 
uh, content calculator and suddenly it's got a giant elephant in it. Oh, this is all making me very sick for South Africa, my homelands where I originally came from. That's why my name's Bessie, it's South African. Um, yeah, oh, it's great over there seeing all the elephants and the animals. If you ever get a chance, just go to South Africa. Look, it's not real dangerous as long as you um, stick to the tourist spots and go on group um, activities with guides and you know dudes with guns and stuff like that. It's all okay and it's a fabulous place. And the people there are really friendly and really nice. Um, and look, we just love it there. But let's not do a sort of travel log on South Africa. Let's get back to this. So that elephant is really irrelevant to a blood alcoholic um, concentrator calculator. Although if we had a picture of a skunk, because in America, I remember there was a saying, hey, dude, you are as drunk as a skunk. So yeah, if we had a picture of those smelly little black and white skunk animals there, maybe that could be partly relevant because it'd be like if you're in America, it'd be relevant because you'd think, oh yeah, drunk as a skunk, I know what that's all about. Um, but if you're in other countries, it would be irrelevant. So if you're making international software, well, it's just Keep the animal pictures um, out of it completely. People are animal enough when they get drunk on alcohol. Uh, responsiveness. And what that happens there is um, the okay message. So when uh, you update this stuff for Alden, maybe you change the coach name or changed his prize winnings here because he's um, just won a heap more money in a tournament. Go Alden, our dream player, um, and click update. It should give a nice little message here so that when you click update, you know something's happened. So it should say update successful. You can just click OK or the X to make that disappear. Um, we've got to fess up here in our app for this in the lesson uh, where you read the text files and you make this little app here. Oh, we totally forgot to put that message in. Uh, so that was a bit of a mess up uh, in the lesson, but look, it's so easily fixed. All you have to do is go to the BTN update code. And this is why it's so great having modularized code because you know, yeah, we've got to make something happen with the update button. So you go to the module that was for the update button and down in here where it does the try, that's where it's actually writing all that text back out to the text file. So look, if that's okay inside this try and it hasn't gone down into the exception, because something went wrong, just put another message box there to show this actual message. So there's the code and there's what it actually does. So it's very easily fixed. And apologies from us, we should have been better with our design and known to put proper responsiveness into that app when we taught you to make it. But anyway, it's all about learning and you've learned a lesson there and so have we. We'll have to be a bit more careful next time we're doing things. Efficiency, oh my goodness, I think this is our last thing. Yeah, it is. Okay, when we built that app, of course, we built it in versions just to take it nice and easy and not be overwhelmed doing a million things at once like we've been doing in this video. Uh, and you might need to get the download PDF and just read through it. And it's a free download for this video. We're doing a freebie, okay? So everyone can get uh, the PDF copy to revise and go through things. When we did the first version of this um, lesson, if you've done this lesson, we actually just kept it simple and they had to type in the player's name and then click a button to show the details and have these details come up. And if they typed in a name like Passy, who wasn't on the dream team, um, that's okay. Passy is not on the team and it just uh, gave a little error message in here. Passy's not on the dream team. Uh, look, that was too much work. Efficiency, it could be done so much more efficiently. So when we had the final design built, what we have is this really cool little drop down box. It just gives you your team members. And as soon as you click on one, bang, all the information comes in. So it's kind of a, a, a pick and click active um, selector. So as soon as you select something, that then causes an action for it to go and read the files and bring in the right photo of the person and their um, biography information. So that is super good. That is efficiency, doing it like that. This is inefficiency. User has to type stuff in. Then after that, they've got to go over and click on this button. This is just pick and click, bang, it all happens. So that is maximum efficiency see maximum speed. So you've got to make sure you're doing that in the design of your software as well. Um, now, finally, we've done all of those things. So let's just talk about commercial software because marketability is another important thing. So if you're designing something you know, you want it to be um, successful and do well, and then other customers can buy it as well. And then you can start making profits. You know, that's why people do startups with apps and things. So look, here's some apps that I just love on my phone. Um, they were really uh, successful. And then people sold them after they built them to really big companies and made themselves millions and millions of dollars 
uh, out of it. So Instagram's awesome for the photos by Passy side hustle or photo business. That's really good. Um, we use Facebook to uh, share information and publicize that business as well. The side hustle, photos by Passy. Uh, you know, the calendar that comes with your phone, and Samsung phone, Galaxy, this is awesome too. You can put in when we've got our photo jobs, all the things that are going on. And Dropbox, we could not live without for sharing uh, information with clients. Uh, and also just for storing our stuff, like we've got backups of all this um, programming course and all that backups in the cloud. And eBay is fabulous too for buying nice cheap stuff like how to learn to program in Visual Basic. Yeah, I did have to read a few books here and there. Um, getting spare parts for cameras really cheap. Um, for our photography side hustle. So they're kind of like, you know, five of our favorite apps that have been really successful, but they all started off with someone just designing an app and following the design rules of, you know, nice big text, things in columns, things in rows, heading at the top to tell you what it's all about. I mean, these are all following good design rules. All of those screens are shown there. So let's just have a quick look at some design assessment. So this was kind of the basic form for the adding two numbers program. Yeah, that's pretty good. Like it's got an okay color scheme. Uh, you know, the font size is good. Simple, clear, easy to read font, not old English history squiggly fonts and stuff. Uh, but look, it could be improved and it has been improved here. It's nice to have this at the top, which shows the goal or what this app is doing. So in big letters up the top, it tells people, yep, this is the app that adds two numbers together. And down the bottom, you know, in big letters, this is the answer of when you add those two numbers. So this is really nice design. That's kind of 10 out of 10. This one over here, kind of, you know, seven out of 10, I guess, um, for design. And our horrible horoscopes uh, lesson, if you've done that one to learn about uh, reading in text files and processing them and using random numbers to randomly uh, pick things from text files, uh, look, that's pretty good. Like it's got a reasonable color scheme on it. Uh, the angry bull here for the Taurus star sign and all the star signs of the Zodiac on there. You know, that's relevant to this app. We've got big letters up the top here to tell us the goal. The goal here is to give you a horrible horoscope and ruin your day. Uh, and so that's all kind of good. The language is nice and simple, like tell me now, tell, uh, pick and click what your star sign is. So even people that don't speak English should be okay with that reasonably well. But um, vision air impaired people, there could be an issue because like if I take off my glasses and go, oh, way back here, um, it's kind of hard for me to read that font because it's so small. And the idea was that we were just fitting the whole horoscope in one line in this kind of result label on the form. So look, if, um, you know, you did a market survey and a lot of the people who are going to use this and people that loved it were, were elderly people that were just bored or wanted to play a joke on their friends getting, so telling them, Hey, pick yourself a horoscope off this thing, uh, that I've got up on my phone or whatever, when this has been, you know, converted by some air taskers into an Android app or whatever. Um, look, yeah, then you would need to change the output possibly just make this a bit longer here. So this could be like a rich text box, spread that horoscope actual output over uh, two lines and make the font a lot bigger so it's a lot easier to read. Um, yeah, so look on that one, let's say kind of eight, nine out of 10 at the moment on design. The one issue is probably accessibility um, for vision impaired people, all right, people that wear glasses. Uh, here's a summary of like just not everything we've covered in this lesson, but just 10 quick commandments of effective design. So I got this from. Um, some conference I went to a while ago, I think some lady and oh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten her name. I should have given her a shout out in the video. But yeah, she came up with this thing said, remember, um, use Karat, Karat Accru to remember all of the things which make a well designed screen. And uh, that could be a website screen or a visual basic form screen or some screen you're making for some other program, doesn't matter. But yeah, there they all are completeness, attractiveness, clarity, readability, your yeah, accuracy, timeliness, having up to date information on their relevance. Um, this general one about communication, the mes message, like, you know, that's kind of having the big letters up the top to tell you what it is. This is the summary diagram and it's kind of a shout out here with the picture that is relevant. 
Uh, we got relevance on there. Yes, here's relevance over here on the left-hand side. Uh, because, yeah, like Moses gave the Jews their Ten Commandments or good rules for them to follow to design their lives and everyone to get along okay. Uh, these are the good rules uh, to follow to design your screens and everyone be able to um, get along with the application and use the screens well. So Karat Accru is a little, um, oh, I can't remember what you call those things, a monomic? I think it's a monomic, a set of letters that's kind of like an acronym for helping me memorize things. I think it's monomic, I have to Google that one. Um, now there is some further reading. If you're a student in Melbourne, Australia doing VC software development, uh, especially in my class, people, you've got that book and you need to do some reading. Um, the Adrian Jansen textbook third edition, uh, maybe this video will be around for a while and there'll be a fourth edition that you'll be reading. But yeah, find the part of the book on user interfaces and in the third edition, it's these um, pages in chapter five that go through uh, the work we've covered here in this um, presentation. And also Mark Kelly has put out a lot of information over the years to help with the Victorian uh, computer science courses that have been around. Uh, yeah, he's got a good thing on his page, but you have to kind of scroll down to this subheading about KK11, uh, key knowledge number 11. And Look, when you download the PowerPoint, that's kind of the front um, page of it. So yeah, that's got some good stuff as well. Because our presentation has been very specific just to doing programs in Visual Basic because it has to fit in as part of our Visual Basic programming course we're doing on YouTube. Um, some of the stuff in here is more general, just about systems and the big picture, like we're talking about with Instagram, Facebook and Messenger all having interoperability, okay? So you'll get more kind of big picture stuff from uh, going through this material, uh, which will help you out with exam questions on this sort of thing, like especially I think in the case study part of the exam. Uh, so even though this one's for a different subject to software development, a subject we've got here in Melbourne called informatics, which is kind of like data analysis um, computing, uh, this presentation actually has some good design ideas too, similar to the ones we've covered here. I think it's more for websites and presenting um, analyzed data, but there still are good things there if you want to do a bit more further reading. So look, thanks for watching this video. And once more, it's been a long one uh, because we wanted to kind of clearly explain the whole Karat Accru, uh, the Ten Commandments, plus a few extra commandments we had in there. We probably had more than 10. By the time you go through all those technical terms we did, they're probably about 20. But look, you have to kind of just do a little bit of hard yards here if you want to be a programmer and a designer and an analyst and all those sort of things, uh, because you just need to learn what affordance means. Remember, that's not if you've got enough cash to pay for it. It's things that program can't afford not to have. Okay, so um, yeah, this slide you're looking at right now, it can't afford to have not like a big heading here telling you what it's about and stuff. Um, yeah, and things like tolerance. Remember tolerance is when you give people simple error messages, don't bombard them with everything they've got wrong on the screen, just focus on one thing, get them to fix that with a simple error message, not some horrible system generated message. So that was tolerance. Uh, so what do we got? Affordance, we've got tolerance, we've got interoperability, okay, where systems talk to each other, like Access and Excel uh, can both talk to um, Visual Basic and give you data and share data. So that was your interoperability. So all of those special words, yeah, look, you just got to um, suck it up a bit and learn those. And I think our next lesson is going to be on... Um, perhaps doing program testing, another one where we're not actually writing a program, we're talking about when you're developing a program, how you actually test it properly and document that in a test table. But after that, we're probably going to be um, getting back into uh, input and output files. So, you know, we're releasing one video a week, so subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the updates. And uh, yeah, we'll be getting back into input and output files because we need to cover like um, XML structure files, uh, CSV, common separated value files, which can come out of an Excel spreadsheet. Um, just reading an Excel spreadsheet straight into Visual Basic. Uh, we want to make a password program for a front screen on our um, 
kind of tennis uh, dream team app. So we're gonna try and store like their valid username and passwords in an access table and interface Visual Basic to access. Yeah, so all those lessons will be coming up week by week by week, uh, one at a time. So yeah, if you found this particular lesson useful, make sure you click the like button and yeah, best to uh, yep, subscribe to our channel and get the stuff. And while we're here, we should also just quick one last mention. Remember there is the Passy world of ICT.com um, programming page, which has all of our lessons on there, okay? So um, that tennis dream team one we've been working on, where is that one? That was reading and writing text files and images, I think. So, you, you know, you just find that lesson uh, click there to go to it. And yeah, that's the one where we're doing the biographies for the players. So there's some things there about what we were doing to get the images working properly on the form for the different players. All the things we did in Visual Basic clearly done step by step. So that was a big lesson. There's a lot of things in it. Uh, there's a video you can watch that explains the whole thing, how to do it in great detail, step by step. It's indexed with a uh, timeline index. So if you just want to know about how do I add player names, uh, array code, and load my combo box up from an array? How do I do that? Well, you could go in the timeline, click on the time code for that, and just go to that section. Uh, now, this one, I think, was a pay lesson because there was so much in it, you do have to pay. You know, $2.50 Australian, less than $2 US, the size of, you know, a few chicken nuggets uh, at McDonald's, three tiny little chicken nuggets. Uh, so really, really cheap and really good value. Uh, yeah, so that's that. You can go to all of that on the programming course and check that out. And that's all we need to say because, oh my goodness, we've said so much. Uh, so enjoy programming in Visual Basic and we'll see you in the next lesson.